Good evening all, and welcome. Life is full of chance encounters. You may even encounter someone who you'd rather not meet, and we're about to find out. I'd also like to take a moment to welcome Mr. Davis, who has graciously agreed to join us for tonight's video. I have also narrated a story over on his channel. It's really good. I suggest you go check it out when we're done. Link can be found in the description and at the end. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. Pretty much anyone who lives in New York City is familiar with the free hugs guys. They frequent parks and high tourist areas, holding up signs that say free hugs, and often charm tourists. Most of them are very peaceful and friendly. They mean no harm, and just want to spread the love. If you want a hug, they give you a hug, and send you on your way. If you don't wish to be hugged, they wish you well, and go on offering hugs to others. However, about two years ago, I had a frightening encounter with one who was far from peaceful. I live in Brooklyn, and I had gone to Union Square to meet my dad who was visiting from upstate. Seeing how I arrived before him, I told him I would meet him on the steps of the park when he arrived. Shortly after I sent my dad the text about my location, I was approached by a free hugs guy who of course was offering me a free hug. Now, being a petite young woman living in a large city, I tend to ignore random men who stop me on the streets to speak with me. And like many women in the city, I have faced a lot of aggressive catcalling. And that has also made me very cautious about such interactions. Plus, I really do not like being hugged by strangers. So I politely decline and wished him a nice day, thinking he would just move on to the next person. A few moments later, I noticed that he was still staring at me. So I got up and moved. He followed me and asked me why I didn't want a hug from him. I was a bit weirded out as I've never seen any of the free hug guys act so persistent. So I politely explained it was nothing against him, but I just didn't like to be touched by strangers. I thought that would be enough, but I was not rude to him in the least. But even so, I started to leave the park and he followed, demanding that I hugged him. Having had enough, I said that I did not mind him offering hugs, but the fact that he was following me was starting to creep me out. This caused him to explode and start cussing. He said that if I did not leave the park immediately, he'd punch me in the face. I started running, but he followed, threatening me still. I was looking for the police, but oddly, this was the one time that there weren't any NYPD present in the Union Square. Thankfully, I made it into a Starbucks and he didn't follow me inside. I told my dad what happened, and by the time he arrived, Free Hugs Guy was now gone. Ever since that event, I've been very cautious about going to the Union Square Park or any other similar place alone. Thankfully, it seems this particular Free Hugs Guy was arrested last year after he actually did punch a woman in the face. He apparently had a history of becoming aggressive, following women and threatening them. However, it's New York City, so I don't know if he's back out there offering hugs but threatening to punch people who refuse them. This happened to me about two and a half years ago. It was October, almost Halloween, and my husband and I were out seeing one of our favorite bands with another couple. Huge, well-known metropolitan area. We were completely wasted, drinking screwdrivers and shots of jack fire. Our friend we were with went to go refill our drinks, and when he came back, he had a girl with him who looked to be around our age. In reality, she could have been anywhere from 18 to 28. He tells us that the girl has lost her dad and wants us to help her find him. We were so drunk and just having an awesome time, we told her, We can't really help you look for your dad, but you can't stand here with us until you find him or he finds you or whatever. No big deal at this point. So the girl stands with me the whole time. We're holding on to each other and dancing. We both know every word to every song, and it was actually just an amazing time. So fast forward a couple songs, and this is when things start getting weird. She starts begging me to come back to her hotel with her and her dad. She's saying stuff like, I promise it's not weird. It's not going to be creepy. I swear we're not the cops, and just overall weird stuff like that. She would not shut up about this. She wanted me to come back with her and her dad so bad. 
I can't really remember everything she said. Like I said, I was inebriated, but what I'll never forget is the most creepy, weird feeling that washed over me when she was saying all this to me. My husband wasn't paying much attention, so he didn't hear what she was saying. For some unknown reason, the friend that came with me, who was married to the guy that brought his crazy girl to us in the first place, turned around and starts cussing the shit out of the crazy girl. I don't remember what she was saying, but it was along the lines of, you need to fuck off. And at that moment, I turned to my husband and said, this bitch is creeping me out, let's lose her. So we ran to the lobby area. I was so scared she was going to find us or track us down or something. I've always gotten the most weird feeling when I think about that night. That girl wanted something from me, but I don't know what it was. It could have been she was just having a good time with me and wanted it to continue after the show. With her being there with her dad, though, is what made it weird for me for some reason. I got the vibe that they could be human traffickers or in a cult or something sinister. The fact that I was so drunk and my spidey senses still went off like they did, that's why I can't shake the feeling I could have been in some kind of creepy danger that night. I live in Big Bear, California, and I was 13 when it first started. It was the middle of February, and I would sometimes go outside at night to take out the trash, or to take a break from my family. But one day at night I saw someone standing across the street on my neighbor's property. It was a man wearing dark clothes. He looked around 5 foot 11 to 6 foot. I wasn't able to see his face, but I could see his stare burning into my soul. It was dark outside already, so I went inside feeling uncomfortable. Two months passed and the man kept watching. I tried telling my dad, but he thought I was being paranoid about someone walking at night and thinking that the stranger was looking at me. I didn't go outside so much after that, more of the fear that something might happen. One day my mum told me to take out the trash at night. I saw him four to five feet away from me. I dropped the trash and went back in and told my parents. My father went out but didn't see anyone and called me a liar and resumed watching TV. I went to my room and looked out the window and saw him. He was hiding behind one of the cars in the driveway and came out of hiding and went back in. He looked at me through the window. I didn't go outside at night anymore. From June all the way till August, when my first high school year started, I started to walk to the bus stop alone and I spent two months walking in the morning every day at 7am. The bus would arrive at 7.15, and I would always arrive at the bus stop at 7.10. I would always go to a nearby liquor store to buy a drink, and one night, when daylight savings started, I saw the man standing on the intersection that I lived next to. Thankfully, my neighbour was outside, so I yelled good morning at him, hoping it would show the man that there was someone outside with me, and he would walk away, and thank heavens... That is exactly what happened. I would walk to the bus, always with my phone out and my flashlight on. And sometimes I would be on call with someone to make myself comfortable walking in the dark. One day I got my phone taken away, so I was stuck walking in the dark. That's when I heard crunching footsteps behind me. It was the man right behind me following. I started to pick up the speed and saw he did the same. I saw the street to my brother's house and started running. When I got to the house, I started to bang on the door, yelling to let me in, and the man got closer and closer, reaching out his hand to grab me, and thankfully my brother opened the door and I pushed him out of the way and slammed the door shut. I was in tears, and tried so hard to tell him, and I finally got the words out. My brother went out with a bat and a flashlight, and saw a tall man running in the woods behind my brother's house. That morning, my brother took me, and I told a friend about it, and he started to pick me up at my house and walk me to the bus stop. The last time I saw the man, it was around 11am. He was across the street. He waved at me and said, in a voice full of nightmares, See you one day. And walked away. I'm now 16, so it's still recent, and I'm scared to walk alone or even being home alone. I really hope not to encounter that strange man again. This took place in the historical area of Turin, Italy, on a school trip with about 10 to 15 of us students. Being a group of college kids and being over the one bar by the hotel we found that we had been to the night before, 
we decided to venture out in search of a new place. On our way, we ran into some other kids around our age that appeared to be locals. They told us they knew of a great nightclub and would take us there. As we were walking, we were all chatting with members of the party and following them through the streets. What first started ringing my alarms in my head was the fact that we came to a sort of main street that had two or three very crowded, very funny looking clubs and we didn't stop at any of them. When we pointed them out, they assured us that wasn't the one they wanted to take us to. So we kept walking, although now I was feeling very sketched out. Another student I was on the trip with then approached me and said he had a funny experience with one of the other Italians. He said he randomly looked at him and said, I'm going to fucking kill you. Laughed and walked ahead of them with the rest of us. At this point, I'm fully scared as we're about to turn a corner. Something was just so... off. If you've ever seen the Spongebob episode where he goes to the very bottom of Bikini Bottom, I swear this is what that neighborhood looked like when I turned the corner. It was just clearly a bad neighborhood, especially for obvious foreigners to be in, and a few of us stopped in our tracks. I wasn't the only one who had a gut feeling this situation wasn't right. Some of us began speaking up and saying maybe we should just go back to the original bar since we'd been walking a ways away from the hotel we were staying at. The Italians protested, saying the club wasn't much further, but enough of us felt weirded out enough to get the others to turn back. I have no idea what was going to happen that night. Were we actually being led to another club? Could we have been set up and robbed? Worst case, trafficked? I have absolutely no clue. And they could have been actually harmless, but it was a life lesson for me for sure. Just because someone is similar to you in a way, in this case the same age of us and appeared to want to have fun too, does not mean they are less harmless than any other stranger. When I was in ninth grade, I switched from a private school to a public one because of money and my mom working way too hard to pay for it. My dad had died when I was 10 and she had raised me by herself since. I adapted quickly since I already knew some kids from the school, so naturally started hanging out with their friends too. In this group of friends, there was one pretty shy kid, but he was friendly with everyone, so I just hung out with him too like everyone else did. One day this kid completely out of the blue asks me what kind of flowers I liked. I told him I wasn't a big fan of flowers, but I thought daisies were pretty, and then he said he was going to take some to my father's grave. I obviously got weirded out and nervous, but kind of ignored it. Once we graduated from junior high and left to different high schools, I completely forgot about this dude until two years later he knocks at the door of my house and asks if he can come in. I took it as a friend just showing up and saying hi, so I let him in. I was usually alone most of the time because mum worked most of the day, so I offered him something to drink. He said no to any offer and asks how I'd been doing. I told him I was fine, and when he asks if I'd been doing anything fun, I mentioned how I started playing guitar and showed him what I had taught myself. The guy bursts into tears, he says he's sorry, and runs out my house. I told no one because I really didn't understand, and didn't want to make him uncomfortable. About a month later he shows up again at my house. This time, my mum wasn't there either. He said he was walking around the neighbourhood completely across town from his house by the way, and asks if he could use the restroom. I let him in, and was sitting by the kitchen table and chatting with my then boyfriend. When he comes out of the restroom, he asks if I like surprises. I got super weirded out, and told him that it depends on which kind of surprise, and he pulls out a rose from under his shirt. He offers it to me. I was absolutely confused and weirded out, and when he sees my reaction he started getting sort of angry. Don't you like it? Oh, it, it's super nice, but I'm not a huge fan of flowers to be honest. Then he starts laughing maniacally, and said it didn't matter a bit. The rose is off its stalk, and chews it and swallows it while laughing. I'm in complete shock. He walks out the house and I lock all the doors immediately. I told my boyfriend and he asked me to pretend not to be there if he showed up again, or to not to let him in if I was alone. A few months after the incident, I went to a party on a Friday, and was sleeping until late the next day. My mum worked early Saturday, and didn't wake me up when she left for work. I woke up for water around 11am, 
and saw my mum had left a note on the kitchen counter and said that a friend of mine had come early to visit and he told her he would wait outside for me to wake up. This was at 7.50. I looked out the window and saw the same guy sleeping under our house tree with his headphones on. I got super spooked and closed my curtains and stayed in my room until my mum got home from work. When she did around 2.30, I heard her outside speaking with the guy and telling him that I was probably still asleep and asked him to come another time. The guy stayed outside my house from 7.50 to 2.30, just creeping. I told the whole story to my mum and she said that he was probably so in love that he didn't know what to do. And she told me to date him out of pity because, well, that's how my mum is, but I obviously didn't. A few weeks later, after I was returning home from school, I found him asleep outside as well. I asked him what was going on, and he said that it was just his favorite place to sleep, and that he did it often. He then laughed crazily and ran. My best friend was already old enough to buy alcohol, and we used to drink a lot back then because that was what rebellious teens did. I was still 16, and she came over to my house and we would go together to buy booze and then get coffee and wait for our friends. I had told her about the guy and the weird experiences I had had, but she didn't know who he was. We left my house just as this guy was arriving, and my friend being super nice was not understanding the million faces and looks I was giving her, and asked him if he wanted to tag along, to which he agreed. He then proceeds to follow us in absolute silence all the way to the store, to buy the booze, and then back to the coffee shop. We sit at our table and every time my friend tries to include him in the conversation, he would just give her one or two word answers and continue in silence. He heard us talk for an over an hour before he just stood up and left. After that, I blocked him on all social media and haven't heard from him since. Every time I talked about the things he did around me to other people that know him, they've all told me how he's super normal to everyone else and no one can believe how he's that strange around me. But in all honesty, I'm scared he's just going to show up again one day and start acting super weird once more. I'm currently on a work trip in the southern US and have been in the area for several months now. I'm from the upper Midwest and this is my first time away from home by myself at 23. Everything has been fine until very recently. I work at this coffee shop with a couple of co-workers and was walking back to my car that was probably parked four or five blocks away. It was a really busy day and many of the good parking spots were taken, so I'd parked in a quieter and less trafficy area of town. I'm approaching my car when a random man I've never seen before pulls up in a tan beat up Honda and parks his car in the parking space right in front of mine. His front hood is facing the front of my car and it's blocking me in. He was heading eastbound when these parking spots are westbound and the only spots on the road. He puts his window down and I make eye contact and he goes, Hey, I have a Christmas present for you in my car. You want to see it? Now, I am a 23-year-old woman. I've heard plenty of these stories of people trying to lure women near their cars to flash them, assault them, kidnap, etc. It seemed way too similar to the classic... I have candy in my van story. My creep alarms were going off immediately, so I politely told him, no thank you. You sure? It's a nice gift. You don't want to see it? I told him no again, more firmly this time. He responded with, okay, God bless. I now regret not making more of a scene and telling him to fuck off. I watched him get back into the road heading eastbound again turned left on the next road and made another left into a very large and empty parking lot that is right next to the street parking I was on. I start packing up my car with a couple of things in a hurry because it was really weird and I was a little freaked out. I look again and now he parks in a parking space maybe three feet from where my car is and he's watching me. At this point, I'm scared. And like a total idiot in a standard horror movie, I lock myself out of my car with my purse and keys inside, in my hurry to get into it. So I quickly walked away. He was still parked in that spot when I left and headed back to the cafe. Luckily, my friends were still there and I was able to call for roadside assistance to get my car unlocked. By the time I met roadside assistance by my car, 
guy was gone. Who knows, maybe it was legit, it just seemed way too creepy, and my gut instinct was to stay away. I am a gay male who grew up in the southern US, the actual Bible Belt, and for reasons unbeknownst to even me, chose to stay in that region for college, early 2000s, directly post 9-11. A huge chunk of people, both students and faculty staff, were quite politically and religiously conservative in their thinking. While I disliked that aspect, it was not at all unfamiliar to me. Hell, as a teen I was actually subject to the occasional intervention about my non-attendance at church and unsaved status. The post 911 aftermath only served to amplify the whole God, family, and country mentality. Unlike many of my fellow LGBT students, I admittedly had a chip on my shoulder about it. Contrary to what some may think, there are bastions of liberal slash progressive belief in such an environment. As such, Groups and circles were quite supportive of anyone who chose to be openly opposed to the predominant mindset. As such, I felt sufficiently assured and confident to be very out and proud, as well as non-conventional in other ways. If that all were not enough, I've never been one to exhibit that stereotypically southern warmth and extroversion. I may be courteous and civil, but I'm also quite happy for strangers to remain strangers. Of course, all of this to say that somehow, for reasons I still cannot grasp, I ended up on the radar of some dude. A titler, who would be friend, whose time and energy probably would have been much better spent on someone more amiable and compatible. And before I continue, I need to emphasize, this guy refused to take no for an answer. So I'm in the midst of my senior year in college, engaged in such tasks as completing what's left of my degree requirements, applying to grad programs and just generally finishing off my undergrad career on an uplifting note. I had really shifted my focus away from extracurricular interests and more towards academics and some semblance of a social life. I had my meals in the university cafeteria, where I'd eat either in solitude or with a few friends depending on our schedules. One day though, I'm just eating my lunch, and some guy comes up and sits down near me, and starts chatting me up, introducing himself as Ron. Right away, this guy Ron is obviously quite outgoing and extroverted, and he really seems to be one of the types who's never met a stranger the very opposite of me. He was seemingly trying to get to know me, by striking up a conversation, and as we tend to say in Let's Not Meet, I thought nothing about it. For my own part, while I did not share his interest in socialising, I was not adverse to the interaction or repelled by him either. He seemed like a decent and personable enough guy, so I made some effort to be nice and participate in the conversation if only passively and that's generally how it goes with me. I'm not especially motivated to reach out to strangers, or even casual acquaintances in an attempt to socialise, but depending on the situation and context, I tend to be cooperative, and cordial to someone who tries to chat me up, by making some effort to respond to their prompts. I know what it's like to feel ignored or unheard, because the other person gives only the most terse and emotionless response. So I genuinely tried to do better by offering actual substantive responses to their statements and questions. In that respect, I did the traditional southern preoccupation of manners and politeness and did in fact rub off on me in a manner of speaking. All that said, I'm not feeling a mutual interest and desire to engage. Then, I'm not feeling it. It's nothing personal against the other, but I can't force it either. Usually, for me to develop a friendship with a new person, it involves some combination of the following. Common interest, shared activity, other type of common ground, or repeatedly casual and friendly interactions over a span of time. Again though, if it happens, it happens. If it doesn't, it does not. To continue, as it turned out, Ron was a freshman, 
so he was a few years younger than me, with a bit less life experience by comparison. At college age, I felt like 18 versus 21 is still a reasonably significant difference in terms of maturity and wisdom. Moreover, this was likely his first time living in a novel environment, away from his more familiar surroundings of home, school and church. Finally, with Rom being such an outgoing guy, it's possible he was very well accustomed to successfully making friends with new people by spontaneously approaching and chatting them up. Combine that with my non-committal politeness and I suppose he decided I was going to be a new addition to his social circle. Again, at this stage I had nothing against the guy because he seemed like a perfectly decent fellow. So when he wanted to exchange phone numbers, I complied. And then he talked about wanting us to hang out sometime. I was copacetic to the idea, in other words. I had no genuine interest in doing so, but I was not actively opposed to the idea either. As some weeks and months passed, he did continue to pursue the idea. The problem was, although I was amiable, I was only amiable in theory. In reality though, I simply had no interest in this person and therefore no motivation to reciprocate or pursue friendship. At that point, I had nothing against him. He seemed like a perfectly okay and decent person, with whom I simply didn't click socially. In my mind, no harm, no foul. Right now, some people may think I should have simply told him directly that I was not interested. Perhaps you may not be so quick to assume that would have worked in my case, but regardless though, I simply declined to reciprocate his efforts. You can think of me of what you will. You can judge me either for not wanting to be friends or for not directly saying, sorry, not interested. But either way, I'm not reciprocating. Then surely the most logical response on his part would have been to simply realize I have no interest and move on, right? Well, that's not how Ron would end up dealing with it. And in hindsight, his subsequent behavior completely validates my initial distance and non-engagement. Maybe I unconsciously perceived it. Like I said, at first the guy was simply friendly and polite, a bit excessively persistent about his efforts to befriend me, so I really had nothing against him either. I probably imagined in the back of my mind that he would just give up and move on of his own accord. Instead, one day in the college cafeteria, he approaches me as per usual and seems his usual outgoing and friendly self, but then he switches, gears and confronts me. Ron didn't raise his voice or even verbally attack me, if anything. His tone was somewhat casual and civil, and he brings up the fact that I had not reciprocated his efforts in a fairly accusatory manner. As I recall something like, you know, you've been kind of rude to me. Basically in his mind, it was a matter of him kindly offering to hand a friendship and me unkindly rejecting it. My rudeness apparently consisted of me never calling him or taking him up by the hand of friendship that he was supposedly extending. I guess he thought he would admonish me for my misdeeds and I would repent over it and consequently mend my ways. Problem is I have a heightened sensitivity to any kind of manipulation via guilt, shame, cajoling, self-doubt, gaslighting, etc. On account of experiencing such things while growing up, you know, statements like, well, I'd be ashamed. That's just selfish. I was really disappointed that you X, Y, Z. Now, what would your dead great grandma think? Well, that's just silly. By sensitive, I don't mean that it works well on me. On the contrary, I mean that it makes my hair stand on end and generally puts me on high alert. If I was politely non-compliant before, then I'll be overtly hostile and adversarial after. On some level, I'm basically thinking, that's it, screw you, trifle with my thoughts or emotions, I think not. Needless to say, Ron attempts at scolding me had the exact opposite effect of whatever he intended. I had nothing against him previously, but him confronting me like this really flipped a mental switch. I was not yet of a mind to be confrontational or hostile, but I no longer felt obligated to be nice either. The exchange that followed was, to put it mildly, very awkward and uncomfortable. And in hindsight, it was the first sign that he had some difficulty in respecting other people's boundaries and personal autonomy. I don't remember exactly what he said, but I basically rejected him to take on events and maintained that I did nothing wrong. I simply told him, that I had been as courteous as I could reasonably be under the circumstances. Following his pushy badgering, my reserves of niceness had already run dry. My overall attitude was one of, sorry, you feel that way, but too bad. After all, if I don't want to be someone's friend, they don't have to like it. 
but it's still my prerogative to make the call, right? Not in Ron's mind. What if I expect more out of you? Then you have a problem there. Quite honestly, I was completely taken aback by this. From my perspective, I had no problem because of the simple fact that his expectation had no concerns of mine. Like, did he sincerely believe that any expectation that he formed entailed some manner of moral or ethical obligation on my part? Really? What kind of person thinks like that? Needless to say, I didn't even know how to reply because, well, it's fruitless attempting to reason with the unreasonable. God damn it, Ron. Then Ron went on to ask why I had not returned his gestures of friendship, to which I simply responded that I'd never felt compelled to. Naturally, he wants to know why not. I could only think to myself, why am I expected to justify my lack of desire to be friends? I wish I had more of a smart ass answer and said something like, why am I not compelled? Uh, how about the lack of a reason that I would be compelled? What is this guy's problem? I mean, his thoughts, statements and behaviors, none of it is rational. Around the time having to deal with him was awkward and distressing. Thanks in no small part to my growing sense of having momentarily stumbled out of reality. Looking back, I realized he was basically engaging in a form of gaslighting, though perhaps not knowingly, as he seemed genuinely to believe his own words, however nonsensical. The interaction of course ended on a sour note, and he put on this demeanor like I disappointed him, while it was just uncomfortable for me, and I was eager to move on. I hoped that would be the end of it. We'd go our separate ways and speak no more. I'd hope. Instead, it was only a short while later, a mere three weeks that Ron approached me in the cafeteria, putting on his default friendly outgoing demeanor like our previous interactions hadn't happened at all. I still remembered it though, so I was like, taken aback? That he was actually attempting to engage me in conversation? Hey man, what's up? At this point, he was just inviting himself into my personal space where he was not welcome, and generally being inappropriately pushy. And this is really where I went from passively averse to actively hostile, because enough was enough. As previously mentioned, while I may not have been friendly in the extrovert outgoing sense, I'm generally nice. At first, I just ignored him. By then, he should have known full well that any communication from him was completely unwelcome. A silent treatment may sound petty, but I didn't care. Of course, he just had to inquire as to why I didn't respond. These days when I remember having said that, I recalled that I was upset and under distress, but not afraid for my safety. It never even crossed my mind to worry about any retaliation. I just told him off, fully blunt and harsh, pulling zero punches, and it really makes me think about all the women out there who have to be careful in responding to unwanted advances, out of fear for their own safety, and I feel deeply for them. I didn't even raise my voice, yet my tone was unmistakable, leaving no room for argument. He got this hurt puppy dog look on his face, and needless to say, he does not get the hell away. Instead, decides to stick around and interrogate and challenge my sentiment, wanting to know what he can do to reconcile or whatever. Again at this point, where I wonder if I've unknowingly walked into a portal out of my own world and into some kind of bizarre backwards world, where all of this made sense, it was almost as if he was treating the situation like a courtroom case. Rather than dignify his nonsense by directly engaging, I simply reiterate that I don't want to have anything to do with him. I was honestly just tired at this point, and I cut him off when he tried to protest or plead. The dude continued to persist for a while, but thankfully he did eventually give up and walk away. Shortly after that, he gave up the good and left me alone, right? After all, being told to get the hell away from someone surely establishes unmistakably that that friendship is off the table, right? For a much longer time, he didn't approach me. He passed me on the sidewalk once and said good afternoon, but I didn't say a word back. No contact, if you will. And it seemed like he was getting the message to leave me alone, but it didn't last. Two months later in the cafeteria, he approaches me again and starts off with an apology in a moment of optimism. I thought maybe he was gonna apologize for having to be so pushy in the past and goes on his merry way. Wrong. Instead, he simply started the same tired old nonsense about how he wanted to be friends. Needless to say, I let him know again that I had no interest in that. You know, the same thing I'd expressed multiple times already, in such explicit terms that even a complete idiot could not have mistaken its meaning. Then he starts begging me for an explanation, which I absolutely did not owe him. 
I stupidly made an attempt at some fault of explanation by pointing out his behaviour at the time, namely disrespecting my wishes, invading my personal space, and then he had the nerve to say stuff like, that it was not an issue of personal space that I was making stuff up. For some reason his rebuttal and the personal space topic included something about his brother having died some years back. Like, that's sad and all, but it was completely irrelevant, so okay then. I then even tried pointing out this kind of persistent pushy space invading boundary violating behaviour spoke very poorly of him as a person, and he's just in denial that his behaviour reflects on his character at all. Also it may have been that encounter or another, but I also made a point of showing Ron my cell phone. You see at some point before that encounter I had saved the phone number of, wait for it, the campus police, so that I could report him if needed. Not necessarily so the cops would arrest him since they probably wouldn't actually have grounds, but I thought maybe I could at least sternly explain to him that he should leave people alone who don't want to be bothered. I flipped open my early 2000 Nokia in order to show him the entry for campus police, just to drive home the fact that I was not playing and was quite ready to escalate things to that level if he didn't leave me alone. You would think that, that would have been enough to get him to immediately disengage and walk away. Granted that would have been great, but nope. He actually stuck around and continued attempting to try and argue and plead with me. Eventually the interaction mercifully ended because I was finished with lunch or anyway, I left. It was puzzling as hell, the whole damn scenario. Even some of my friends were wondering why is he so desperate to be friends with someone who doesn't want to be friends with him. Anyway, I simply graduated college, so never had to see him again. He never tried to contact me after either, thank goodness, and on the other hand, being the petty guy I am, some small part of me almost wanted to look him up and send him a message. I would never actually do that though. But Ron, please, stop invading my privacy, and let's never meet again. This happened when I was really young, about six years old, I think. There's this mall in my town that I really like to go to. My father would pick me up from school and bring me there. We would eat something in the food court, and then I would go play in the indoor playground near the food court, which you have to pay per hour. My father would wait outside reading a newspaper or a book that he bought from the bookstore near the playground. So that day I went to the playground, but got bored, so I got out early, maybe half an hour. I looked where my father sat, but there was no one there. Panicking, I started to cry really hard, and this man approached me. He was about 40 or 50. He asked me why I was crying, and I told him that I couldn't find my father. He then said in this really calm, reassuring voice, I just saw your father in the toilet. Come with me. I'll lead you there. And he reached out his hand. Even in my six-year-old mind, it didn't make any sense, but I was about to go with him, but I thankfully looked around one last time before going, and I saw my father looking at some books in the bookstore. I completely forgot about the guy and ran into the bookstore. When I think about this, I always get creeped out. What if I didn't look around one last time? What if I didn't look at the bookstore? It's crazy how one little thing you can do can change the whole situation. So, to the creepy guy at the mall with clearly twisted intentions, let's not ever meet again. Myself and two others were invited to hang out with a buddy called Chris, as the other two were called James and Annie. It was around a quarter to eleven when we arrived at his house, and upon our arrival we walked to his front door. I reached my hand out to knock on the door, and as soon as my fist made contact it flew open. An excited Chris greeted us with a loud hello, and we all greeted each other and then made our way into his home. We all sat in the living room, spoke for a few minutes when Chris says, I'm so hungry. Go eat something then, Annie said. We shushed him, and that's when James said, how about we go get McDonald's? As soon as those words left James' mouth, Chris jumped up and stood next to the front door. I stood there and made my way over to Chris. Annie sighed and stood up. I know she didn't want to go, but we'd pay for her. So we all got our jackets and shoes, and we left. The scary stuff happened when we were around halfway there. 
We walked for 10 minutes when we saw a lady wearing a white t-shirt and a bunch of different colored stains on it and a pair of blue shorts that barely fit. As we got closer, we realized she was talking, but no one was next to her. I remember a little bit of what she said, something about Utah State and the lady next door. I was pretty paranoid and thought as we walked past her, someone in the bushes was gonna jump out and attack us. As we got closer, I said loud enough for her to hear me. Last one to McDonald's has to pay. And with that, we all broke out into a sprint. Right before we passed her, Chris stopped right in front of the lady. As we walked towards Chris, I noticed she was talking to her. This is when I got a good look. It was dark and all I could make out was a head of crusted black brown hair. She had dark eyes that seemed to have something in them and something that made me feel bad for her. She had brown rotting teeth and her breath smelled like death. I tapped Chris on the shoulder, but he pushed my hand away and was still engaging in conversation with the lady, who was known as Linda. Where are your kids heading? She said in her dry and raspy voice. Just McDonald's, Chris answered. How old are you guys? Her face was twitching as well. Fifteen. And then a huge grin appeared on her face. She slowly stood up, causing all of us to back away. She took a few steps closer, and with that we ran. She gave chase all the while screaming things like, I'm not gonna hurt ya, and Come on, you're scared of an old lady. She was frail and looked like a skeleton. I don't know how she was able to move at the speed she did. The big golden arches appeared in front of us and we ran in. She realized that she couldn't catch us, so she picked up a rock and launched it at us and it hit me in the back. As we got closer to the McDonald's, we heard her screaming obscenities and that she was going to get us. We pushed through the McDonald's entrance and began panting. And he slouched down into a seat with James while Chris and I went to order. We got our food and we all sat down and ate in silence as we were pretty shaken by what happened. Once we were heading back after we were done eating, we saw the lady at the gas station across the street. So we legged it so that she wouldn't see us. This happened about 12 years ago. It was Christmas Eve. My mom and I went to London Drugs in Edmonton to pick up last few minute gifts and stocking stuffers for our friends and my sisters. My sisters and my cousin Keith went to go look at Candy Cane Lane and give my mom and I some peace and quiet. London Drugs was closing, so we went to the till to pay for our purchases and wait outside for my sisters and cousins. We decided to sit in a semi-well-lit area in front of the door to have a smoke and wait when this man walked behind me. I immediately got the chills and goosebumps. I looked at my mom and nodded my head away from the doors that the man was now rattling and banging on. My mom, not being the brightest person in the world, sometimes shouted at him, Sore's closed, dude. He just kind of glanced back at us and continued beating on the doors and swearing. Finally, I grabbed my mom's arm and moved to the opposite end of the store from this freak, and I told her the feeling I got. Just then, my cousin pulls up, and we rushed to the car and went home. The next day after opening presents, we turned on the television and saw a news report about the same London drugs that we were at that was broken into and robbed at gunpoint. I looked over at my mom, and now, every time I get goosebumps from someone, we stay as far away from them as possible. Hey guys, it's Mort here. Thank you so much for listening. I'd like to extend a huge thank you to Mr. Davis for joining me in tonight's video. Haven't worked with him in a long time. It's been a really long time, like at least two or three years. So I'm really glad that we could do this again. Thanks, buddy. I actually narrated a story over on his channel, like I said earlier. And if you'd like to hear it, feel free to check out the link in the description. It's really good. I had a lot of fun doing it. You'll like it. Let him know who sent you though. For now though guys, I'm gonna leave that link in the description and on screen now. I hope to see you there. Until then, stay awesome. Thank you to all my amazing members and patrons. And I'll see you in the next one.